If you grew up in Arizona, the names Wallace and Ladmo probably conjure up a lot of memories. Characters like Gerald and Captain Super, the song parodies of Commodore Condello, and the countless attempts to win a Ladmo bat. Of course, if you didn't grow up in Arizona, you're wondering what all the fuss is about over a silly little kid's TV show. Well, I'm Michael Grant, and on this special edition of Horizon, we're going to step into the time machine and take a look at a truly unique chapter in Arizona history, the Wallace and Ladmo Show. It was the dream of a young man who grew up in the New York suburb of Bronxville, making people laugh. And for 35 years, Bill Wallace Thompson did just that on the Wallace and Ladmo show. Kids show a combination of cartoons, wacky skits, and a cast of characters that range from a spoiled brat to a superhero who quite honestly could not fly. Here now to tell us about the show is Bill Thompson, and also with me tonight, is Richard Rellis, an Arizona Republic columnist who has written a book about Wallace titled Thanks for Tuning In. Bill, Richard, this is pretty cool. Yeah, usually you're doing serious stuff. You have, like, <laughs> the governors here or corporation commissioners. Yeah, you have a yeah, man who had a set fall on him. I, uh, that was dangerous, what you were, what you were doing there. Oh, now, anything for a laugh. <laughs> yeah. Hey, now, thanks for having us on. Well, thank you for being here. Yeah. Yeah, the, the clip that we showed was the was the your first appearance. It was called the Gold Dust Charlie Show. How Ken you... Kennedy had a one of the early kid shows on uh, KPHO back in '51, and, and Gold Dust Charlie was the character that Ken played. And then in '54, I, I was working in the art department, and he let me come on um, and do some routines with him. So my show actually was a spin-off from the Gold of Charlotte show. Now, you, you grew up in New York in an apartment near Central Park, right? Oh, that's, yeah, when, when I was born. But we moved out to a small village in Westchester County. And you headed out to Arizona to make your fame and fortune on the Wallace and Ladman show. I, yeah, I wasn't sure what was going to happen. I ha had a cousin that lived down here, and uh, Ned, and he called and said, hey, they're opening up a TV station. That was in 49. Right. KPHO signs on in, in, in 1949. Right. And so I said, gee, I'll, <clears throat> I'll have to come out and, and see what I can do. I, I had always uh, drawn pictures and written about this character named Wallace Sneed when I was a kid and in high school and in college. And so I, I was thinking um, television or radio or I didn't know what, yeah, right. you know. And, but I, <clears throat> I, I came out and I applied uh, three or four times before Dick Rawls and Bob Martin hired me. Well, in fact, Richard, you were showing me, you got a cool picture in the, uh, in the book. There's a book? Uh, there's a hey, I happen to have a copy. Have have I happen to have a copy. Yeah. What do you me? call that? Uh, thanks for tuning in, which was his signature catchphrase, available at, at your finer bookstores and actually some not too finer ones. <laughs> we pretty much sell it anywhere. But you get you get a picture in there of of Wallace at a fruit stand. Yeah, I mean he really came out here. Uh, fifty two. I don't even know if we can get a shot of it. But uh, in fifty two, he he came out and and on spec for a job, and he kind of glossed over the the part where he had a, a yacht at his disposal where he could go up and down the Hudson River as a kid. He came from fairly nice money. 
Yeah. Uh, in fact, it was you growing up that that formed the basis for for Gerald, right? <laughs> the, 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 the rich little kid. I guess. I don't know. I did. My mother once showed me a picture of me when I was like six in a little red velvet suit. I couldn't believe it. But that, that stuck in my head. I mean, you t he took ballet lessons at a point, and no. tap dancing, and, and all, all these. I mean, he, the Boyce Thompson Arboretum outside of Superior, and this is something that, you know, I, I grew up here, and I grew up on the show. I didn't know this, because he didn't mm -hmm. tell people. The Boyce Thompson Arboretum outside Superior, that's his family, the Thompson family. He had a fairly nice life set up for him in New York, had he chosen to go the traditional go to college and get a nice degree. Yeah, your, your family was uh, heavily involved in mining here in, in Arizona. Right. Now, n yeah. none, of, none of those bucks uh, trickled, down no, to, no. <laughs> trickled down to <laughs> your <laughs> level? I mean, oh. what are we doing here in TV? <laughs> no, no. Yeah, first the fruit stand, and then uh, I got $25 a show at Channel 5, 25 bucks, you know. And I. Yeah, that, in 54, hey, I thought well, it was that's great. That's some real money. Yeah, you, you could actually live on it. <laughs> but he, yeah. he gave up that life to chase a dream under, which makes a really nice Arizona story that you can sort of move yourself from New York uh, and, and, and have this idea that you want to be on TV and make people laugh. And here in the desert, he found a spot where he could let, reinvent himself and let that happen. Now, you grow up watching... Wallace and Ladmo is is yes, that at least the, is is that at least part what what leads you to yeah does it show that I grew up watching the show? <laughs> yeah I think it does no I mean I, I was I was one of those kids out there and I and I remember uh, watching the show I don't remember not watching the show let's put it that way uh, and at seven I was on uh, with my Cub Scout troop I think you remember that show do you remember that show where you had a Cub Scout troop on absolutely okay. <laughs> And, uh, it was the only time it happened, wasn't it? <laughs> the Cub Scouts were, were on once and Boy Scouts were on once, <laughs> if I recall. That we're never allowed again. No, I mean, that was the magic of it, you know, and a lot of people had kid shows growing up. This one was nice. It had a, you know, you were, could be part of a studio audience. You could actually meet these guys that were local celebrities. So I was on it at age seven and, and missed the Ladmo bag by one seat. And the whole, the whole spiel, I came to ASU and the state press assigned me to do uh, a story sort of like, where are they now? Mm -hmm. And that's how I started meeting them. We put out about 10 years ago, we put out a coffee table book, sort of a retrospective of the show. But the publisher of that book had talked to Wallace and me about doing his biography, which I happen to have a copy of right here. <laughs> no, I mean... What do you call that? Thanks for tuning in. Oh, okay. He, he right. had never told his story, and obviously <laughs> even tonight, he's, he's, he, he, uh, he glosses over. So it was nice to be able to get his story down in print. You know, Bill, I showed up in uh, Phoenix in, in 1967, much to the chagrin of just a ton of, ton of people. And everybody was telling me, you got to watch Wallace and Ladmo, because it's really not a kid's show. It's, it's, it's an adult show. Yeah. I mean, did, did, did it kind of evolve to that yes. point? Yes, it started out as a kid's show, and then McMahon came along in 60 and just exploded the demographics, college kids and high school kids and parents, you know, adults were watching. So McMahon is responsible for the show lasting as long as it did. Because there was a lot of satire, there was a lot of political commentary on it. I mean, it was, it was a kick. Yeah, we sure had fun. You know, uh, I was, <laughs> Richard started writing this book, but I was not his first choice. Oh, who was it? Sam Miranto. <laughs> <laughs> he had hypnotized me to write a You're, book about it. Right. Oh, you are going to sleep. <laughs> right. So I'm <laughs> default. But I think he did a good job. And, and thanks again for letting us on to talk about it because he stuck with a, uh, a warehouse a full of those books. Okay. <laughs> And incidentally, if you haven't been following along here, it's called Thanks for Tuning In. It's, yeah. a, it's available at fine and not-so-fine bookstores uh, everywhere. Well, listen, we skipped to uh, McMahon, but, but first, first I want to focus on uh, Lad. We got a clip from 1955, and Ladmo is shaking hands with, uh, with an octopus. That's, yes. That, that, that's early on when he joins, I take it. Yes. Okay, we're gonna load. <laughs> we're gonna load that that puppy up here. If not, we can try to recreate it here live. Right. <laughs> yeah, all right. Uh, How's your place? Glad to see you. Where have you been? Welcome home. How've you been? Hello there. Welcome home. Hello. Ladmo. What? What are you doing? I'm shaking hands with an octopus. 
Hello there. Welcome home. How have you been? Glad to see you. Hello there. <laughs> you know, this Ladmo was a cameraman on the show, and I did it for a while by myself at first. He was a funny guy. And he I... Makes good athlete, too. Yes, four years varsity baseball at ASU. And I asked him to come on, because I'd run out of one-man material, you know. And so he came on, and his first bit was, he comes on, and he's looking around, and I said, what are you looking for? And he says, my Congressional Medal of Honor. <laughs> and I, I said, I said uh, well, where'd you lose it? He said, out in the lobby. What are you doing in here? And he, he says, the light's better in here. <laughs> and, and, and uh, it, that, that was the first day, so he was back the next day and for the next 36 years. A, he, a funny guy, a nice guy, and the, the kids really liked him. There's so many great accidents that make the show happen. I mean, not only Wallace coming out and, and starting this and getting lucky enough to get hired. Ladmo was supposed to be at the University of Arizona playing baseball. Instead of going to Tucson, though, he came to Arizona State University <laughs> and played baseball here. Uh, really, and, and so it's an accident All of, it. of yeah. fate that he gets there. And McMahon, Pat McMahon, is breezing through town uh, on leave from the Army, ready to go to Hollywood to try to make his uh, name in stage and screen, is, stops here, flicks on the television show, happens to be Channel 5, happens to be them doing a, a spot for Ruskets Flakes, a cereal where they're making fun of the cereal, making fun of the, uh, oh, making oh, fun okay. of the product. Right. And he thought, I like this uh, show, I like this station, and he eventually gets on. Well, and you know, that was also a theme of Wallace and Ladmo, and we've got a clip on that on, uh, on Shamrock, I think it is. You guys uh, really were into beating up the, the uh, sponsors, and that was, that was kind of unique back then. Yeah, we didn't want to... Uh go straight and start doing a hard pitch. So we wanted the whole show to be funny. So, yeah, we, we used to drop kick scooter pies and, you know, the works. And maybe we can pull that one up. Uh, it's a Shamrock product yeah. uh, endorsement, and I think we're ready to roll it. Let's, right. let's take a look at it. We have all of their products lined up here in our Jolly Green Shamrock. All right, buddy, buddy this, is this is the hole up. This is the hole up. Pick them up. Put your hands up in the air. Wait a minute. We have ways of taking care of crooks and bad guys on this show. Come on. You fool. You've never heard of Captain Super, the greatest comic book hero that ever lived? Why, just look here. In the latest issue, what he's doing. We have ways of taking care of people like you. I have the magic wand. I have the power. We say the secret word, and Captain Super will be in to take care of you, crook. What did you want, anyways? Uh, I want the Shamrock Cottage. Gee, that's what I want. Come on, this is my don't first do job. Don't, don't confuse me. And the secret word, justice. Hmm. Justice! Oh, I don't have time for this nonsense! Oh. Oh, now I'm terribly sorry I'm late, Wallace. The traffic out there is terrible. <laughs> you know what was amazing? Uh, the. the Arizona Historical uh, Society, as you know, has a whole wing of their building devoted to you. And when I was on the, the set taping the, uh, uh, taping the open of this thing, small set. Yeah. I, I, really? Yeah. Uh, uh, our set was um, large enough at, at the station, but you're right, the one at the museum is tiny. Well, and it only had a couple of rows of kids. And how many how many kids would the would the studio uh, seat? I want to take a shot. Say 40, 50, something like that. Exactly, about yeah. forty. Okay. Yeah, there. and parents off to the side. You know, Richard, uh, you were making the point that because they beat up their sponsors, the, their competitors would try to take advantage of that. Well, yeah, early early sales meetings at other stations. Wallace, we get wind of this, that uh, other hosts, for the few times there were other hosts, would come in and say have us endorse your Sharpie because we won't make fun of your product and try to make that as a, as, a, as a point. I think the sponsors later realized, like Shamrock must have realized, it's all right if Captain Super destroys our products because people will buy them. People really like this show. Uh, he only had competition for about six, six, seven months. After the show started, every other kid's show that was on the market went just, off the air. Just seeded it. Yeah. Now, Bill, I understand that as KPHO would rotate in new general managers uh there was kind of a 
there was, there was sort of a transition period here where they'd look at the budget and say, let me get this straight. We're spending $12 million on this, this kid's show. What the heck are we doing? I mean, you have to break in new general managers to... Well, the big thing is usually a kid's show is one guy in a sock, you know. <laughs> you know, but it was three of us, and, and over the years, we added other people, you know, too. We had Dan Horn and... Kathy Dresbach and Ben Tyler, and, you know, and, and so it got to be a pretty big cast. But uh, as long as we kept up the ratings and as long as the commercials were all there filling up, you know, um, <laughs> they let us go. Yeah, general managers w would, would have to learn about the show because it was unique. Like you said, most, in most cities, if you grew up with a kid's show, which mm -hmm. means you watch between early 50s and, and early 70s, it was just a guy who was the weatherman or something. You know, it would be as if after right. this show, you would go host the, uh, yeah. the kids' show. Yeah, that's right. Uh, this was unique in the way that it was popular beyond just little kitties and hard sells of products, that it did reach everybody, that it was such a ratings giant. You did the show for 35 years. Does that mean you did 35 state fairs because you were always at the, at the state fair yes. two, three shows a day when I was here? Right. Yes. <clears throat> we loved working at the fair. They, they finally named a stage after Ladmo. The Ladmo stage down at the fair. It's still there. That's right. That's right. Okay, we've already talked about uh, Pat McMahon, but we've got... See, we've got a clip here on an, on an Army skit. It's... Um, uh, it's a source of embarrassment to me. <laughs> and and, and you're, you're bringing together the, 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 this, this cast of, of characters. Kind of set the stage for this, for this thing. It's oh, it's the, just, it's the just uh, Lad and Pat and I just doing a little army and, drill and thing. And you're doing something. an army drill uh, yeah. uh, uh, deal? Actually, yeah. one of the few clips where McMahon doesn't play one of his characters. Yeah. This must have been early on. Yes. When he, but he, yeah, he did hundreds of one shots. Uh, um, this is one of the tapes that I, I wish had not been picked. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's roll it. What the heck? Left, babe. <coughs> that wouldn't happen if you had the rifle up on your shoulder okay. where it belongs. All right. Sorry, it's it's very embarrassing. There's a lot of people watching. I gave you a big build-up. One more chance. Right, babe. Ooh. What's the matter with you? Well, just put the rifle down. I'm sorry, I didn't mean it. Oh. How much of this stuff was, um, was, was improv? I mean, how, how much was scripted and how much was just, well, okay, I get, we got a break coming up here. We got to do something. McMahon's character bits were pretty well st structured and written. But he would ad lib coming into the bit, he'd ad lib leaving, and everything else was ad lib. It's just those uh, particular bits when he did all of those characters who were remarkable because they all had different voices, they all looked differently, they had different personalities. He, he just was a great asset to the show. Well, and you could tell from the costumes. I mean, you guys must have dropped, I would say, seven to, to eight bucks. Easy. <laughs> just, just on the costume budget alone. Right. I, it's fact, this coat is... <laughs> Grudgemeyer used to wear this. No, but it's, I mean, McMahon was such a brilliant character actor growing up on the show, it took me a long time to figure out that it was just one guy playing all these, all these characters. Uh, and it's to his credit as an actor, and it's to Wallace's credit, that he made this rich tapestry of characters, all of whom could hold up for several years, all of whom had a deep psychological flaw somewhere in them. We mentioned, you know, you saw Captain Super, who was right. kind of cowardly and talked about communism more than he saved people. Marshall Good had never been on a horse, he was the cowboy. The clown, who didn't like children, Bafo the clown. Right. Everyone was... was <laughs> it's funny. And that was sort of standard, you know, you see the stuff on Letterman or see the stuff on Comedy Central. This was really unique for the time. And then you have Gerald, who children but hated. And kids who hated. He incited so much passion out of children with this one little character of Gerald. And part of that, Bill, was it, you thought that um, uh, that Gerald could incite the audience the same way that professional uh, wrestlers kind of incite the, incite the audience. I used to work for Ernie Mohammed, the wrestling promoter, and I'd watch these guys, and I said, boy, this is great. So it's the old, who's doing what to who behind who's back and who's getting blamed for it, and the audience is trying to tell the referee, to, you know, and I was the referee. 
and you had like the, the heel and the baby face wrestlers as Ladmo and Jero. Uh, and it worked and it was a lot of fun. And the kids, they were the like the fourth cast member, the, uh, the, the mm -hmm, kids, because mm -hmm. they knew their part. You, right, right. You know, what, uh, that was to try to tear his clothes off and beat him to death. You know, <laughs> it, but but it got sometimes it got a little dangerous. I yeah, mean, the kids they, the, they, the kids would really get into it. Yeah, Legend City, they it took a, a a gun away from one guy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there was a, a someone walked up with a crucifix at another show. Oh, and the very first time Gerald was even on the air, he'd only been on the air four days. He had only made four appearances before his first public appearance out of the stage show, and the audience went so nuts attacking this kid who was the little rich kid who was only on the show because he was the nephew of the boss of the station, that they tore the stage apart. McMahon had to run in his Gerald costume into a truck as the children rocked it back and forth. And that's when I said to Lad, I think we're on to something. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Yeah. You know, yeah, the uh, relationship between you and uh, Ladmo must have been pretty special, I bet. Yeah, he was like a brother to me. He just, uh, he just the greatest guy he had a good attitude, he was positive, and the only thing he ever got mad at was umpires, you know. And that's, <laughs> right, which right. is easy to do. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but he was great to work for, so optimistic, so helpful, you know, and, uh, and a truly funny man. Okay, well, I am told, we've got a, we've got a clip of uh, Gerald and, and uh, Lad Mo. And I can't find that on my list, so. It must be the poetry contest. Oh, it's the poetry contest. That's right. So uh, let's, let's see if we got that loaded up. Let's run the uh, uh, Gerald and Ladmo. In yeah. all fairness to Gerald, he did deliver a literary masterpiece, a beautiful poem. Gerald gets the trophy. All right. Oh. Right there. I don't care what you said. Just don't you forget it. Right here, the possessor of the official poetry. However. Trophy. Ladmo gets the runner-up second place consolation prize. Runner-up? A thousand dollars. A thousand dollars! Oh, my God! <laughs> that is when funny. He, he told me about the wrestling thing. When he mentioned working Madison Square Garden and working the wrestling ring and saying, I want to incite that behavior in children, it clicked. And I was like, that's what he was doing to us. That's what he was doing, pulling us in, making us so angry <laughs> by, little, by little tricks. It was fantastic. Yeah, well, you mentioned the, the kid with the crucifix. That was one of the funniest things I ever saw, that uh, Gerald was just giving the, the kids in Coolidge a, a real bunch of static, and they were all screaming out, and this kid comes marching down, he's got this crucifix, and I knew it was going to be good. I just knew it, and I got the kid up, and the kid says, I swear by all that's holy, it's Gerald doing the bad stuff. And he took the crucifix, and he wheeled around and went like that to Gerald and McMahon, put his hands over his eyes and started screaming, <laughs> fell on the ground and rolling around, my eyes, my eyes. And the kid picked up that one little kid with the crucifix and they carried him around the auditorium on their shoulders. Oh, that's funny. And Ladmo, of course, funny. was just, uh, it, when Ladmo laughed, it, it was uncontrollable and a, after a while, no sound would come out, just the tears and that. And one time, a guy named Alan Franklin was doing the rodeo parade, and they had film of it taken that morning, and they were showing it. He was sloshed when he did it. And he came in to narrate the film, to narrate the film. Yeah. And so Lamo's watching the monitor, and we're sitting there, and you can hear the guy upstairs. Here comes another cowboy. <laughs> <laughs> Well, nothing just like, collapsed. Nothing like live TV. It was, right. I mean, as you, as you listen to, for those who didn't grow up on the show, when they hear about Gerald and, and anger and violence, and, and mm -hmm. this was just a funny show, and I think that's the thing he realized early on. I don't just want to make children laugh. I tell you what, though, politicians took it uh, pretty seriously. I mean, over its run, about every major politician in the state showed up on you, you have a show with that kind of ratings, as, as this does. <laughs> yeah, right. Hey, this, this is his 25th, 25th anniversary. 25th anniversary. Well, it's 25th anniversary. It's coming up? Yeah, it's coming up. Well, it's okay. Okay. But who's got it? But th this show was, was one of the must-stops. I mean, uh, every, every governor, every mayor, uh, if you were running for office, you had to make your stop on the Wallace and Ladmo show. Barry Goldwater during the 1964 presidential campaign. He, yeah, he came on... Um, 
we tipped him off that Ladmo wanted to put one of his Ladmo drive-ins on top of Camelback Mountain. And <laughs> Goldwater came down to complain about it. And that's the thing. It wasn't just that they were making, like, little appearances. They were doing comedy sketches. Barry Goldwater was doing comedy, uh, which is fairly remarkable when you consider this legendary politician that we all know. To people in Arizona, he was just a really good character on the walls of Ladbush. Well, listen, I'm getting a signal from the, uh, from the control room to go to the time machine clip. Oh, this so is we've the... We've got the time machine clip. This is from the 79, This I think, is from the 20, 25th anniversary. This has show. probably not been oh. seen since yeah. it first aired. Thanks for tuning in and thanks for watching the last 25 years. Before we go, we're going to turn on the time machine. We'll set the dial ahead 25 years to the year 2005. Thanks for all the memories. Thanks for being here. Richard Rellis, great book. It's called uh, Thanks, Thanks for, for Tuning, tuning in, in, if and I I'm recall suing correctly. Him. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for watching this special edition of Horizon. I'm Michael Grant, and in the words of Wallace, nice to see you. Thanks for tuning in. If you have comments about Horizon, please contact us at the addresses listed on your screen. Your name and comments may be used on a future edition of Horizon.